So this video, I'm going to go over prefixes and suffixes. The English language contains an enormous and ever-growing number of words. Enhancing your vocabulary by learning new words can seem overwhelming, but if you know the common prefixes and suffixes of English, you will understand many more words. Mastering common prefixes and suffixes is like learning a code. Once you crack the code, you can not only spell words more correctly, but also recognize and perhaps even define unfamiliar words. Quiz time, quiz time, you gotta know what a prefix is. So here you got a here you have a bold and a little arrow, which means you gotta memorize this for the quiz and write it down on an index card. A prefix is a word part added to the beginning of a word to create a new meaning. Study the common prefixes. So prefixes come at the beginning of the word. Dis like dissatisfied, miss, as in misspelled, un is, so dis, miss, un, oh yeah, so dis, miss, un, re, inter, pre, non, super, sub, anti, those are all prefixes. And anything dis means not an opposite of, miss means wrongly, un means not, Re means again, like re-election, repeat. Inter means between, like interrelated or interstate highway or internal to your inside, to your um, what you're doing. Pre, before, mean like prepay uh, or like a pregame, like before football. Uh, non means not, which means nonsense. Super as an above. Well, I could think of as Superman. Uh, sub, under, like a subway or a submarine. Anti, against, like antibacterial. Okay. Oh, wow, they use the same thing, I w and I wasn't even looking at it. Anyway, so these are all examples of prefixes. There are so many more. And if you can buy yourself uh, or, or Google pre common prefixes and memorize their meanings, you'll, 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 you'll instantly... In, increase your vocab vocabulary. Suffix. A suffix is a word added to the end of a word to create new meaning. And so suffix comes at the end of the word. It also changes the part of speech. Okay, so if, if it's, you have a suffix like ly, then that's an adverb. If you have a suffix like n-e-s-s, -S, then it becomes a noun. And so um, when adding suffixes like n-e-s as an l-y, the spelling of the word does not change, but it does change the part of speech. And most words that end in l-y is an adverb. An adverb modifies the verb. So darkness, scholarly. And when the word ends in y, change the y to i before adding ness and iy. So readily, oh yeah, that's on your quiz. They're going to give you a, a, a choice, like readily, like just the, the, just the R-E-A-D-Y plus L-Y. And then they're going to say, is this a correct word or not? So you have to know this rule. When the word ends in Y, change the Y to I before adding ness and L-Y. So readiness, happiness. When the suffix begins with a vowel, drop the silent E in the root word. So here, instead of saying care eating, you say caring. Instead of saying you eat it, well, you say usable. When the word ends in CE or GE, keep the silent E if the suffix begins with A or O. Replaceable, courageous. So in this case, you keep the E. When the suffix begins with a consonant, keep the silent E in the original word. Careful careless, exceptions to the rule three, truly, argument. When the word ends in a consonant plus y, change the y to i before any suffix not beginning with i, sunnier, hurrying. When the suffix begins with a vowel, double the final consonant only if the word has only one syllable or is accented on the last syllable and the word ends in a single vowel followed by a single consonant. Tanning, so here you have to double the N. Regretting, you double the T. Cancel, you, you, don't, you don't have to, this, this one, because the accent is not on the last syllable, 
you don't have to double the, the consonant. So you double the consonant only when it's accented, when the word has only one syllable or is accented. What, what they mean by accented on the last syllable, that's about pronunciation. So if I, I, I say um, privacy, okay, then the accent is on the i. If I say privacy, the accent is on the va. So that's what I mean by, so if the word is accented in the last syllable, like this one, canceled, then, um, I mean, that canceled. So, so it all depends on where you uh, accent your word. So on your own sheet of paper, write correctly the forms of the word with their pre suffixes. So we'll, we'll do this as an exercise. Referred, R-E-F-E-R-R-E-D. Reference, that's it. That's, that's fine just the way it is. Moping, we take away the E and become M-O-P-I-N-G. Approval, well, we take away that E and it becomes A-P-P-R-O-V-A-L. Greenness, okay, uh, benefited. And then resubmitted, we have a double T, I-N-G. Usage, we take away that E. Gre greedily, greedily, we uh, I-L-Y. And excitement stays as excitement. Uh, and so a prefix is a word added to the beginning of a word that changes the word's meaning. A suffix is a word added to the end of a word that changes the word's meaning. So learning the meanings of prefixes and suffixes will help expand your vocabulary, which will help improve your writing. Synonyms and antonyms. Synonyms are words that have the same, almost the same meaning as another word. So uh, if you use a thesaurus, that is a thesaurus of synonyms. That's how you expand your vocabulary. And so uh, the English language is filled with synonyms. So let's see, hold on. It is important to remember not all pairs of words in the English language are so easily interchangeable. Um, the slight but important difference in meaning between synonyms can make a big difference in your writing. For example, the words boring and insipid may have similar meanings, but the subtle differences between the two will affect the message your writing conveys. The English language is full of pairs of words that have subtle distinctions between them. All professionals and beginners alike face the challenge of choosing the most appropriate synonym to best convey their ideas. So I always tell students, use a thesaurus. And so on your own sheet of paper, write a sentence with each of the following words that illustrate the specific meaning of each synonym. And so these words have similar meanings, so they are syn synonyms, but they are used slightly differently. And if you want to know how to use it differently, you have to look at you have to look up the word leave in a dictionary. And then the dictionary will have a sample sentence and tell you how it's used. Then you look up in the dictionary, abandon, and it will tell you how that, that you have to look up each word to find out how it's used uh, properly. And then you learn the proper meaning. So synonym is when you have words that have similar meanings to each other but that similar, but not quite. You, you have to learn what that slight difference is. An antonym are words that have opposite meanings. In other words, hot, cold, okay? Uh, good and bad. Um, what else is there? I can't think of it. Absence and presence, accept, true and false. There you go, that, that, that's, an, that's an easy one. True and false, that's, that's an antonym. Things that have opposite meanings. Evil and good, okay? Being evil, or, oh, good and bad. Yeah, those are all antonyms. Absence, presence, accept, refuse, horizontal, vertical. These are all examples of, um, you know, common antonyms. And so you, you should, you should, this is a great way to learn vocabulary, okay, is to learn it through antonyms. That's why dictionaries not only give the definition, they give the synonyms, and they give the antonyms. So learning antonyms 
is an effective way to increase your vocabulary. Memorizing words in combinations or in relations to each other is a great way to increase your vocabulary. And so you should I will stay on this a little longer so everyone can take a screenshot of this list. Okay, this will help you learn more vocabulary. And so synonyms are words that have the same or almost the same meaning as another word. Antonyms are words that have the opposite meaning of another word. Choosing the right synonym refines your writing. And so now we're done with 11.5. Okay, so this video has prefixes and suffixes synonyms and antonyms, and now I'm going to go on to uh, context clues. Context clues, so now you got to learn this for the quiz or for the test. Context clues are bits of information within a text that will assist you in de deciphering the meaning of unknown words. Since most of your knowledge of vocabulary comes from reading, it is important that you recognize context clues. By becoming more aware of particular words and phrases surrounding a difficult word, you can make logical guesses about its meaning. The following are different types of context clues. Brief definition or restatement, also known as an appositive. Sometimes a text directly states the definition or restatement of the unknown word. The brief definition or restatement is signaled by a word or a punctuation mark, such as an appositive. Consider the following example. If you visit Alaska, you will see many glaciers or slow moving masses of ice. So the slow moving masses of ice, that's a context clue to give you to tell you what exactly is a glacier. Okay, and here, or if you see the word or, that is a signal word that tells you that a context clue is about to come up. Matt Marina was indignant, fuming mad, when she discovered her brother had left the party without her. And so if you see a hyphen, that's also a, con that's also a signal that a context clue is about to come on. Because what exactly does indignant mean? If you don't know what that is, well then she wrote it out. It means someone that's very angry, okay? And if you don't know what fuming is, you, you, you'll, you can tell Oh, well, that person left without her. Well, obviously, she's not just going to be a little mad. She's going to be very mad. So just from that sentence alone, you can guess what the meaning of the difficult words are from the rest of the sentence. That's called context clue. You guess what the, bad, the, the hard words are from looking at the easy words. So that's how, why I tell students that the more they read, the more vocabulary they learn, the better they write. And these days, people don't read enough. Hence, people have lousy vocabulary, and they write very poorly. Sometimes a text gives a synonym. So these are more kinds of context clues, OK? Sometimes a text gives a synonym of the unknown word to signal the meaning of the unfamiliar word. When you interpret an image, you quickly, you actively question and examine what the image uh, connotes and suggests. Likewise, the word but may signal a contrast which can help you define a word by its antonym. I abhor clothes shopping, but I adore grocery shopping. And the word abhor is contrasted with its opposite, adore. From this context, the reader can guess that abhor means to dislike greatly. And I had an ESL student, that's how he said, Oh, you know what? I bet you that the reason why she says that she loves something and the next time the teacher said abhor and she had such a disgusted look on her face. So that's how I figured out that abhor means hate. You could all, but that's in the face to face. So here, I knew Mark's aliophobia was in full force because he began trembling and stuttering when he saw my cat Ludwig slink out from under the bed. Although this Allurophobia is an unknown word. The sentence given gives an example of its effects. Based on this example, a reader could surmise the word means fear of cats because the person was trembling and stuttering when he saw the, the cat come out of from under the bed. And so when you're able to guess what a difficult word means from all the other words, 
That's how, uh, and this helps your reading, by the way. If you learn context clues, um, and, and, and you learn, so here, they're, they're, these are some examples of context clues, where they give you a word that's really hard, and then if you see the a positive, that is a, a definition, a context clue set off by two commas, then you can mortify means way beyond embarrassment. Omnivore means people that eat both plants and animals. So that's an omnivore. And so this is how you use context clues to guess or figure out what the harder words mean. And so that's, a, that's what a context clue is. So context clues are words or phrases within a text that help clarify vocabulary that is unknown to you. And then there are several types of context clues including definition and restatement, synonym and antonym, and example. And then the very last one I'm going to do, I think this will be the last one for this one. And I'll do 11.7 in the next video. So if you have any questions, and if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to the Professor H Writing Channel. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at any time.